Good evening and uh, good morning, both. Uh, I suppose it depends on what side of the ocean you're on, but um, certainly uh, delighted that you were able to join us for this uh, webinar on um, uh, put on by the Asia Society of Southern California. I know there's a partnership with both USC and UCLA, the major um, uni research universities here um, in Los Angeles. And the title of tonight's program is COVID-19, the implications for real estate on both sides of the Pacific. And we have assembled a really, really erudite and incredibly expert high powered panel for you tonight. I'm just honored to be able to, to speak to this particular group. And, um, but before we begin, I just, I just wanted to acknowledge a, a partner from the ACES Society of Southern California, the former executive director, Jonathan Karp, who was very helpful in helping me organize uh, this conversation. And so the panelists really need no introduction, but I'll just mention that it, it, we have with us uh, Dr. Vincent Lowe, founder and chairman from Shuyan Group. Uh, we have Goodwin Gaw, uh, chairman of Gaw Capital Partners. And you might mention, you might notice some of his, or recognize some of his projects on stateside as well, including his most recent acquisition of the Hollywood and Highland Complex in Hollywood. We have Jamie Lee, who's the chief executive officer of Jamison Realty Inc. And they are very active in the urban core here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have Adriel Chan, who's executive director of the Hang Lung Properties Limited. He's also calling in from Hong Kong. And last but not least, we have Rion Roski, who is the managing director and a board member at Majest Majestic Realty, major real estate company here um, in, well, in this, on, on the state side. So, and my name is Tim Kalahar. I am the executive director of uh, what's called the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate. We're a joint research center of the UCLA Anderson School of Management and the UCLA School of Law here on campus. And I assure you for that we have a good representation of both Trojans and Bruins on this particular panel. Um, so I just thought I would, there we go. I see the, the victories. Um, to start out with some initial thoughts and some framing comments uh, with respect to our conversation. And, um, you know, the COVID-19, um, we've seen a lot of programs recently, as certainly I've been involved with many that are really focused on mitigating the current uh, sort of financial and operational disruption, whether that be lease agreements and force majeure and a number of other things. And we certainly can address some of those this evening. But I think what I would like to do is focus, take advantage of this really high powered uh, panel and have a conversation more about what the recovery might look like and what the new normal might look like. So just taking advantage of the, expert, the expertise we have here this, this evening. So COVID-19 was very different than any of the other downturns we've uh, experienced. Um, you know, really the, the global economy and particularly the US economy were quite strong uh, just two months ago. So this thing really hit, you know, it was not like we saw the train coming. It was a really almost like a black swan event. So this is much different than the other downturns we've seen and the Fed chair and other economists believe that we're in a better position to recover once we can get this pandemic behind us and get infection control or vaccines or whatever have you. Um, but this is a much different situation than any of the, any of the other uh, sort of recent downturns we've had. It's been a little interesting for commercial real estate, which usually lags uh, in a downturn, but this time uh, commercial real estate was really affected immediately because businesses were just sh um, shut down uh, right away. So it's been a little bit unusual in that regard um, as well. Um, and some of you may have seen the 60 Minutes, it's a news magazine, very reputable news magazine here in the United States uh, last night where we had the Fed, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, give some pretty stark uh, forecasts for the near term. Um, indicated that we might see as much of a 30% retraction in the, uh, the US economy at its peak, um, which had obviously rattled markets here, um, and then prognosticated and forecast that at its peak, unemployment might reach as high as 25 to 50%, uh, 25 to uh, 20 to 25%. And I can remind you that 25% unemployment rate was the unemployment rate in the United States during the, the Great Depression. So we're really, really in unprecedented times here. Of course, China was the first major market to be impacted by COVID-19, causing unre, you know, unprecedented restrictions of mobility. And it caused, uh, at least economists predict, about a 6.8 contraction 
in the U.S. economy in the first quarter of this year. So clearly, um, you know, a hole that we're going to have to to dig out of. And I'm thankful that I have a group like all of you to be able to help um, work through some of these things and figure out what the new normal is. And so with that incredibly rosy outlook, um, I'm going to start the conversation with, uh, with Vincent Lowe. Um, and here's the question. So as an early real estate investor in China, you weathered your share of economic challenges and seen your share of cycles. The two-part question, uh, what is your assessment of the global economy and your near-term outlook given the fraught relations between the U.S. and China, which we are both worried about on both sides of the ocean? And then secondly, based on what you are seeing, what factors will aid China's recovery and, the, and thus the outlook uh, for real estate? So thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Tim. Two very big questions for me. Um, I'll try and be concise. Uh, you've already mentioned some of the backgrounds, and I think the, the current recession that we're going into are very different from our past experiences because past recessions have more, been more like results of business cycles, uh, structural imbalances, energy shocks, and et cetera. But this one, the COVID-19, I think it's something so new and the characteristic is totally unknown still to us. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, scientists working on it, but in Hong Kong, we're seeing cases reappearing after the patients have been released from hospital. So the, the asymptomatic carriers, I think those are the worrying part. And also I read one report saying that um, this COVID-19 is SARS plus uh, AIDS together. So it's, it's really worrying. And I don't think the vaccines are going to be uh, available anytime soon. And then we also have a background of um, a very political um, charge environment in the world, protectionism, nationalism, extremism, and deglobalization push, and then geopolitical uncertainties all around. And then at the same time, we have asset prices trading at its peak because of all the QEs from, 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 from the previous uh, crisis. And, and now that the um, COVID is hitting the world, I think the global recession is really taking shape and, and really pushing hard. And I am not sure that we're going to go get out of this that easily because the COVID-19 is actually in disrupting supply chains, consumer demand, and then all the service industries, right? Tourism, it's almost dead. And then of course, um, Tim, you just mentioned about predictions on the U.S. economy and IMF is also very bearish on the world economy and all the major countries are, are going to see a recession this year, depending on how much. Uh, I think the only uh, country that might still be positive, uh, the major economy of all the major economies is uh, China. But China is not going to hit the uh, target uh, growth rate for sure not nowhere near six percent i think china will be lucky to have two to three percent and then of course jp morgan also came out with um, the purchasing managers index it's the lowest on record 26.5 last month the previous low record was 36.8 in november of 08 so all these i think are, are, are very worrying signs for the world and and right now unfortunately the world should be getting together to try and fight this common enemy. But unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of finger pointing. People are looking to China and say, you should be compensating us for all these um, viruses. But we're also seeing reports saying that um, this uh, virus has happened maybe in Europe and US even before the end of last year. So I think let, let the scientists work on this. We, we, I don't want to cover this. And then just now, um, Tim, you also mentioned about the China-US relations. Um, last year, and the phase one trade agreement was signed, but unfortunately with this current world situation, whether the agreement can be implemented in full, I think it's a big question mark. And then also, I think the rhetoric between the two countries in the recent weeks I think it's actually worrying, very worrying, because it's 
sounding more and more like a cold war. And I think with the two biggest economies in the world at loggerheads, it's not going to uh, really bode well for the recovery of the world. And just now I was talking about restarting the economy. Uh, given that we have been uh, probably 10 weeks or so ahead of uh, the US and Europe, um, restarting is not going to be so simple and easy because the supply chain has been disrupted. So um, right now we're still not in full swing, although we've started work uh, quite, quite, I basically have been working all along, but I don't feel that the momentum is there. And then also, um, uh, a lot of our staff are still worried and they're asking if they can come in two shifts so that they don't have to get onto the mass transit. And all these, I think, are, are, are going to be impacting on the world economy for sure. And then, uh, Tim, you asked me about the um, China uh, situation. Um, just now I mentioned about um, China not hitting the target rate, but it will still be in a positive growth area. And I think the government is going to be pushing for domestic consumption. Fortunately, I think China has 1.4 uh, billion uh, population. And then there's going to be a lot more investment into infrastructure, not necessarily the high-speed rail or the highways. It's more, I think, even the 5G and things like that. So I think it's going to be helping. And then, of course, the government is going to lower tax and then lower the charges for the for, for, for the businesses. And I, I would believe that China would be pushing for more reforms and opening up. So uh, this year, I, I, I think it's, it's almost a, a, a write-off. Um, but next year, I think we will see significant growth coming back to China. And coming back to properties, the last few months, of course, everything basically stopped because construction stopped on, uh, on site and then uh, even sales offices uh, will close. But in the second half of March, we're seeing the buying interest coming back. And just to give you one example, I have a luxury uh, apartment blocks um, opening for sale soon. Um, and the most expensive unit, the biggest unit, I have over 20 interested parties wanting to buy that. It's costing almost 20 million US. And people are still keen to buy because I think people are seeing the volatility in the equity market and Asians, particularly Chinese, love properties. So I think people still want to um, put their money into the real estate. So maybe I'll just stop there and later on we can discuss in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Well, there, there certainly is a, a flight to safety and um, real estate typically falls into that category. Um, as you mentioned, central banks across the world are certainly working to stimulate their local economies. Just one quick follow-up for you, Vincent. Um, the, the SARS experience in Hong Kong and in Asia, uh, was that a, a, a sort of a lesson learned that put the Asia in a better position to react to the current coronavirus? Oh, for sure. Because the SARS, I think, hit us here in Hong Kong and, and Guangdong quite badly. And then, but fortunately we contained that and SARS wasn't as bad as uh, COVID-19. And then we bounced back very, very strongly mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the second half and, and the year after. But, but that was a, a good experience uh, and prepares for this one. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll take a deeper dive into some of these particular issues uh, later on in the conversation. I did want to turn to Jamie and let's take a, a quick look at the United States um, market, um, and in particular Los Angeles, where you, I know, are heavily invested. Um, and Jamison, I know, uh, any of us that have followed the news have made substantial investments in uh, multifamily assets, particularly in the urban core. And I was wondering what your forecast is for the multifamily market in LA. And do you believe that COVID-19 will have an impact on the demand for dense urban living, which has been the trend recently? Thanks, Tim, and thanks so much for having me tonight. I swore I was gonna come in here and be the optimist, but Vincent has made me very depressed <laughs> the last few minutes. Um, I still believe that the marketplace is very, very strong here in Southern California, particularly in LA and even more particularly here in the center of the city of Los Angeles, where Koreatown resides um, in recent years. 
there has been just a tremendous growth in urban living, transit-oriented living. There's been huge pent-up demand, um, great rent growth that we've seen in the center of the city, especially among the millennial population. Um, people used to call it workforce housing. What we build is not luxury, um, um, but or necessarily affordable with a capital A, although our projects do have an affordable component, but what we're really seeing is you know, younger millennial professionals, um, many of whom are still considered essential workers or have the capabilities of working from home currently. Um, so we entered the multifamily market in 2014, starting by converting some of our more outdated and underutilized office properties into multifamily. Saw tremendous success there. So simultaneously began acquiring land and doing ground up construction in Los Angeles as well. Um, and we've delivered approximately 2,000 units over the last five years. We've got another 1,000 coming online throughout the rest of 2020 and probably 2,500 more in the pipeline. So I like to think of this COVID era in phases, um, probably a post-management scenario and a pre-management scenario, whether that's a vaccine or advanced therapeutics for being able to tr uh, treat the disease in a very effective way, or potentially, as we've been hearing much more of in contact tracing and um, use of technology, whether or not Americans will get on board with some of the more intensive technology-based um, uses that are happening in Asia right now, particularly in places like South Korea. But uh, in the near term, the reaction has seemed to be one more of hesitancy as opposed to gloom and doom. I think we're seeing you know, people pushing off construction starts where they're able to do so, a pause on acquisitions and dispositions as opposed to you know, throwing hands up and canceling deals outright. I think we've seen some mutual assent from buyers and sellers to just take a hold for a few months um, and see what happens. Uh, there are those still doomsday speculations that this is the end of our use of real estate, whether it's residential or office as we know it. Um, however, I think there are some factors that are moderating people's fears as well. Um, you know, rent growth has stalled a little bit. New leasing activity is a bit slower on the apartment side. However, there are a lot of things booing that as well. Um, single family homes have sold. The sales are equal to the same period um, throughout first quarter of 2019. Anecdotally, I'm still hearing from people in that sector that there are multiple offers on most properties in the city of LA. A lot are trading for well over asking still. So the strength of that market is sort of trickling down into people's need and the demand for um, rental units and multifamily. Um, and collections have been much stronger than anticipated. And we're seeing across the board, the numbers are coming in in the low to mid to high 90s for April and even in May. Um, there also seems to still be a pent up demand for leasing. And it really just seems to be the restrictions of people not being able to come out or not wanting necessarily to come out and risk the exposure of touring, but virtual tours and inquiries are high. Um, a lot of the inquiries are coming in for later in the summer, July, August, September. And so we are optimistic that when people are more used to putting on a mask and going out and doing um, the business that they need to do, that we'll see that growth in rent happening. And then, um, you know, delaying construction starts will also keep this sort of supply and demand um, balance moving. Construction pricing is going to come down a little bit more too, even after sort of these ill-advised tariffs and trade policy that has been in place over this last year. Steel is already starting to come down a little bit. And I think with um, whatever happens in this recession, I think it's undoubtedly a recession regardless of the numbers yet to come in. Um, labor pricing will come down too. And so that will help um, promote future construction starts. And we're still in a very, very low interest rate environment. So financial institutions are very risk averse right now, but I think they will still need to come out and lend. So we'll see that loosening up in the months to come. But in the long term, in a post you know, managed COVID world, I don't really see how these changes can be wholly permanent, um, especially in LA, which even in our densest places is not nearly you know, the dense urban area that New York City is. And of course, New York has suffered so much 
in this time period. Um, but I still believe that young people are used to living in, in dense areas, are fine raising families in multifamily projects and um, and we'll still need to be where the jobs are. I've always, you know, long said that our, um, you know, time with friends and family is more important than having a big house far away and suffering the long commute times. I still think that people will want to live in big cities. And, and what we're really saying too is that um, there's a drive to be near people. If you're saying that you know offices are permanently moving out of downtowns and into suburban areas, if people are permanently moving away from the center of cities um, and can't be in office spaces anymore that circulate in the um, in the kitchen area or in conference rooms, then you're also saying that people are not going to sporting events anymore or clubs or concerts or festivals or conferences to network. And I think there is sort of a permanent human drive to be together and realistically if there is a vaccine or if there's a safe way to be together people will continue to do so and, and we can talk more about that on the office side as well later on but um, you know even as people are sparking all these fears of companies contracting because more people are going to work from home which is likely true to a certain extent um, we've heard from most of our tenants that they find true productivity in their office space collaborating with their coworkers. And there will also be, you know, a slight move to slightly lesser dense uses of office space. So that square footage per employee that has crunched down so tightly, as tight as it, it can be really over the last several years, I think will loosen up and that use of office space will balance out. Mm -hmm. Is your flip from office to resi, is that, are you using the, uh, the adapter reuse ordinance here in Los Angeles? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that segues very nicely into the, the next question I have for our good friend Goodwin. Um, you know, we, when we were speaking on the phone, you mentioned that you had been hearing about the move from the urban core to suburbs for 30 plus years. Uh, certainly technology existed for some time that allows workers to work remotely. Um, uh, but I know office, the office sector is your uh, largest area of exposure. And so what's your what is your forecast for the office sector and the sentiments of office workers as we recover uh, from the pandemic? Hi, Tim. Uh, before I dive into that, maybe I just want to make a couple of comments on, on uh, what Vincent and what Jimmy also said. Absolutely. Um, obviously, I grew up in this real estate business, uh, learning a lot from Vincent. In fact, I worked summer job with him at one of his construction subsidiary way back then. So he is an idol and a mentor. So I actually have been generally a bit more optimistic until what I just heard from Vincent this morning, obviously. <laughs> um, but regardless, I want to point out a couple of numbers, right? We do have an extensive business in China and a couple, couple of things do tell you there's some optimism. Uh, we actually have a fair bit of these premium outlet shopping centers in China, for example. I think we have six of them, about five million square feet, and Three of them are reopened, and two of which do not have capacity control, meaning we can actually let people in as long as they're wearing a mask and temperature control and the app, uh, QR code check, health, health status and all that. The two that have no capacity control within about four weeks of reopening, one is already 30% above of last year's same period turnover. Uh, another one actually just caught up to last year's same period turnover in a matter of three weeks of reopening without capacity control. So people do seem to get comfortable once they are back allowed out. Uh, in Hong Kong, actually, we have been going out. I've seen the restaurants that were frequent when, the, when they were told it's four per table, every table is full at, um, at four. And then once they release it to eight per table, every table is full now at eight, right? So people do have a relatively short memory once they get comfortable. Obviously, one of the big help in Asia, as you mentioned, because we went through SARS and maybe it's a cultural issue, the wearing masks become a courtesy rather than being told what to do, right? So when you, I was asked earlier this week about whether we implement any capacity control in elevators, two per elevator or four per elevator, how do you deal with a vertical transport on a big office building? We actually said we don't have capacity control. We don't need to, because if you're, you're the only person, or only two person not wearing a mask in the elevator, people will walk in, stare at you, and may not even come to the elevator because you're not doing your part to be courteous. To, to the other participants or the other occupants in the elevator, right? So that's a big change. Um, and then in terms of China economy, I think it's going to be interesting to see the tug of war, right? China is going to actually stimulate with QE. For example, they just wrote a consumption coupon, 
where they're actually encouraging people to spend. If you spend to buy a car, buy a refrigerator, buy any big goods, you get rebates in cash. So they haven't had, actually had to even resort to a lot of fiscal and monetary stimulus yet. They're just doing consumption coupon. So it's gonna be a tug of war between um, government trying to get the domestic economy to spend versus the contraction in export. That's actually potentially creating job losses. So whether the domestic consumption can actually outspend the contraction of export, that would be interesting to see as China will probably have to roll out these uh, monetary and fiscal policies. Um, and then back to your question, right? When I got into the business in 1990, I, there was a whole wave of people saying, everyone is gonna move to the suburbs. They got the big homes, they got the swimming pools, they got the yacht, they took out the dog, dogs. And uh, that means offices will go suburb by, to go to suburbs. Hence, when I started my business in LA, the company is called Downtown Properties. For that very reason, I believe human are social animals. Collaboration creates an energy that induces creativity to allow people to share ideas, to create, to innovate. People want to be together. And now all these urban cores are reurbanized because all the amenities are there to attract the people who want to be together. I think that hasn't changed. Te technology has been available way back then. So when I started, we were buying up empty office buildings in urban core, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, on and on. The whole idea is people want to be together and that actually hasn't changed, right? And then secondly, can everyone work, on, work at home? Of course, if you do believe everyone is gonna to move to the suburbs with big homes, big yachts, work at home is quite comfortable. But if you do believe younger generation continue to like the amenities rich urban core, music, sports, restaurants, bars, all the elements that bring people together to socialize and also generate ideas and innovation, then it's hard to replace that. And if people are still in these urban core, if that's your fundamental belief, their homes are too small for them to actually work. Many of these young couples are two income household with young kids. They cannot work at home. Right? Case in point, our, many of our office buildings in downtown Los Angeles, a lot of our tenants are asking, are we still open? Can we continue to be open? Many of our office is actually closed in LA right now because of shelter at home order. But half my office is probably full because people actually, my staff ask, can they go back to the office? Because they want to work in the office rather than at their own home to deal with the distraction, right? And then also I think there was, uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think it was Yahoo a couple of years ago, maybe 10 or eight or 10 years ago, they went through a period where they say, everyone can work from home. Um, on a full flexible offices. I think they quickly abandoned that idea because they saw how, quick, how fast the productivity dropped. And this is for a big technology company, right? And also if you are a driven young rising star, you're gonna be, want to be seen in the office to actually be a leader among your colleagues. So you get the recognition, you get a credit. And, and that, does, that hasn't changed, right? That will not change in the near future. Um, but I suppose we could potentially see some of these companies, it will go by industry to industry. Industry that doesn't require as much innovation or creativity for people to be together may say, we don't need a huge centralized headquarter or a large regional headquarters. But then they may de-densify that, that uh, regional headquarters. At the same time, they actually may open up a lot more locations for people who, work, who are working from home to have a convenient place to get to, to collaborate to go into a meeting room, maybe a living room, maybe much more collaborative space. Uh, maybe that's the evolution of these co-working space will go into where you actually, well, I guess going back to Regis model, I, IWG model, where you are actually creating these congregation space in a more lifestyle setting for people who are actually working remotely or working from home to go and collaborate, right? That could happen. But in totality, that also means you may be using less centralized space, but more decentralized space uh, to, to create that new environment. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that the Chinese government was stimulating the consumer side by offering rebates and things for durable goods. So that's an interesting approach. They did that exactly in uh, 08, 09 to quite a bit of success. And, yeah. and that's the first start again. And, you know, the mask issue, I think part of it could be a little cultural. I think a lot of folks in the United States believe that it's being imposed upon them to ask people to do that. Whereas I think um, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, in Asia, they're doing it really out of a cur courtesy towards other folks and uh, to, to control the spread. Uh, I, I personally would like to see, think of wearing a mask in the United States as being an, an actually a patriotic act. So um, we're a little bit different culturally on this side of the ocean. Thank you very much, Goodwin. And so with that, let me just uh, move on to, to Rion.
And uh, Majestic is the largest privately held developer and owner of master plan business parks um, in the United States. And you have, I know, a big exposure to industrial assets. And the industrial market was doing extremely well before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I think largely driven by e-commerce and some other forces. But what's your forecast for the industrial market in light of COVID-19? And do you believe that it will continue to be a strong sector and vacancies will remain very low? So we own about 90 million square feet of um, industrial buildings throughout the United States and California, Nevada, Texas, um, Arizona, um, Atlanta, Georgia, um, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. I think I have them all. Oh, uh, Colorado too. And um, the industrial market has been We've been pretty much 98% leased up in the high 90s. Um, usually, we sometimes we have like one or two spec buildings in a given state, but it, 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 they pretty much lease up. Most of our tenants are e commerce. A lot of our buildings are the big million square footers or two million square footers that we have in Pennsylvania. Um, so, before the COVID 19, we were finally the sweetheart. We've never been the sweetheart in the real estate industry in the United States. And I would, last couple of years, we have been. Um, during COVID, um, we're seeing a lot of our tenants struggle. Um, or some are struggling, the smaller ones. The larger ones, e-commerce, is doing gangbusters. I mean, they are, they're just as busy, if not busier, in, in the transportation of goods coming in and out, out of those buildings. And they've been fully operational for the most part. Um, where um, for construction, unlike um, China or Hong Kong, I, I think Vincent mentioned that some of the construction slowed down and um, or slowed down. In the United States, construction continued, um, at least for us, all of us, except for Pennsylvania, that for a while, we had to stop construction there. But everywhere else, um, we we're building buildings and we're continually building buildings. For the banks, I think that was another question um, or option. We, we finance, we do traditional forms of financing and we do banks and life insurance companies. And we usually finance each building by itself. Sometimes we put two or three buildings together, but pretty much it's one building at a time. And we, um, we don't really have a lot that is coming up, that came up in the last two months or that's coming up in the next month or two. But the few that we did um, for industrial, they pretty much are signing right back up um, and we're able to refinance. Some of the hotels, we had a hotel that we went, we are just refin refinancing. We're not taking any money out. And it is, um, it's not leveraged high at all. Mm -hmm. And it is, we had problems with the bank changing terms. Um, and we, and so it is getting a little bit harder to get our loans um, or the terms are changing or they're trying to renegotiate. I think we're lucky to be in the position we're in, but I'm sure out there it, it's hitting people. If, if you happen to be having that, if you waited too long to refinance, and um, I would think it's tough now to get money for new construction. Our construction, we tied up all those um, construction loans before COVID-19 or in the first couple of weeks of COVID-19, we quickly um, got them tied up. But I would think it's now really, the market is tough and they see the risk. Um, for our tenants, the uh, being the movement of goods, I think in the future, looking in my fall, I think that they will be doing well. Um, they're only going to get stronger. People are, let's say, you're less going to be going to markets. And now industrial buildings will become markets and the delivery of food. Um, some smaller space is turning into restaurants. And um, they're doing multiple kitchens in one industrial space. And they're being able to deliver the food. Um, I think that also with, I, I presume with Trump trying to bring, you know, commerce and, and industry back to the United States, that will help. I'm not sure yet. That's still to be seen. Um, 
with, um, I think what hurts us is the politicians are deciding when we can open. We do have a little bit of retail and some of the retail companies are, um, are being hurt. You know, some of them that don't have that e-commerce platform like a TJ Maxx or Home Goods or some of the clothing, you know, like the, the um, clothing outlets that have one off pieces, you never know until you go in there. They're, they're Marshalls, this is the one I was thinking of, they're having a hard time because they don't have that backup. Um, and with these politicians, they're also having these government ordinances. And to us, that's huge right now because being, they're making the commercial landlord being, uh, you know, a bad person and allowing, and I think a lot of times the politicians do not really realize the ecosystem of that if a tenant doesn't pay rent, what's gonna to happen to the landlord? You know, can the landlord maintain the building? Can the landlord still pay taxes? There's no incentives to going to landlord and there's no relief of, of paying our mortgages. And um, I personally wish that the politicians would just kind of get out of our business. Cause I mean, we're doing contracts with Fortune 500 companies and in some areas where there are these ordinances that a tenant does not have to pay rent. Some of these big Fortune 500 companies that are running their operations and, and making a ton of money in these buildings are saying, well, you know what, we don't have to pay you for a few months or we can defer it for six months. Or there's now um, a Senate bill in California that would allow a tenant to not pay you for over a year and they can defer they could defer the rent for a whole year. So then you're not gonna even really see your rent for two years from now. And then allows a tenant to terminate the lease. And I mean, that's huge. I mean, that's not what America is about. And you have contracts and there's sophisticated parties and we have to honor our side of the contract. Um, so it's a little bit scary out there right now with all these midnight ordinances coming, coming around. Um, that was it that I thought of. Oh, gaming. So um, we own um, a casino up in Vegas and everyone's always asking me, when's the casinos gonna open? And it, you know, the casino business is a regulated business. And um, like we've submitted our plan, business plan for reopening. We probably will be reopening sooner than later um, since ours is a smaller casino and it's more local casino. Um, but it's, you know, the Las Vegas business, and I'd love to hear, you know, what's happening in the, ga in the gambling, you know, outside of Hong Kong, but, you know, our business is tourism, meeting, convention, and with people not traveling or going to meetings and convention, I think it will be a long time for that business to come back, um, at least a year from when it opens up and when people start feeling comfortable to go back into a casino and um, with the people. Um, and then with sports, um, you know, I was even asking my dad this question today and, and we were talking about like, nobody knows. I mean, who knows? I mean, the arenas, that business, we own Staples Center and LA Live in Los Angeles. And it has been really hit hard and our, employ, you know, you just have to close the whole business down and who knows when it's going to open up again. And I, some of the teams are starting to practice right now or this week they're starting to practice and, and then hopefully they will have games, but they're going to be on TV and the whole underlying, underlying economics of sports franchise is going to be completely changed because the only money, normally you make a lot of, most of your money on your ticket sales, your hot dogs, your hamburgers, the game day experience, the season tickets. And if you, if you don't have fans there and you're only relying on the TV revenue, the TV revenue is not enough to, you know, pay for these players and to have these teams. Um, it, and those, that TV revenue was negotiated five or 10 years ago or three years ago or whatever, depending upon which um, major league sport you're talking about. And they're not anticipating, you know, there was none of the anticipation that there was, you know, 10,000 people watching versus a million people watching, I'm, you know, just throwing numbers out there. But 
that money goes to the TV. That doesn't, you know, really come to the teams. So uh, the, the economics on that will be interesting. Yeah, well, certainly, you know, and I've heard interesting things about construction. I mean, obviously, fortunately, construction was deemed an essential business. So housing construction and other construction is continuing. Um, it's also somewhat jurisdictional. I did hear from some industrial folks who are not allowed to actually go under construction on their projects in the Bay Area, like Fremont, for example. But all the other jurisdictions, they actually were able to continue with their with their projects. So thank you very much for that. We're not and, Fremont, so I, I didn't know about Fremont. Yeah. Every area so, we're in, it's yep. allowed to, except for Pennsylvania. That was the only one. So let me turn to Adriel. Um, so among other sectors, you play very much in the high-end retail space, as we were discussing earlier. Um, uh, what is the post-COVID-19 forecast for luxury retail uh, in Asia? And in your opinion, uh, opinion, what is the likely shift of market share to e-commerce relative to tr traditional brick and, brick and mortar? Now, I understand you play in a slightly different space in the high end, but maybe you could talk about kind of the retail, different sectors of retail from kind of your shopping mall center income uh, type retail all the way up to the luxury product that you're, you're developing and investing in. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me, uh, uh, Asia Society. Uh, so in terms of luxury retail, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Um, I think long term or even medium term, there's no fundamental shift. Uh, so retail has done not particularly well uh, when, you come, when you talk about mass and general retail, uh, but luxury has come back in a big way. Um, we own 11 shopping centers across nine cities in mainland China. Most of it is high end. Uh, we're one of the biggest landlords for LVMH, uh, Richemont and Caring Group. Uh, that's the Gucci Group. And what we've seen is January this year was already kind of up a high single to uh, double digits uh, compared to last year. Obviously, February, when things started locking down, March, uh, were very low. Um, and then in April, we started, things we started seeing things come back. So April was basically on par uh, with last year, uh, 2019. And then in May, so we're now into the last or second last week of May, uh, things are actually looking really, really good. I think there's a little bit of a, a bounce uh, where people have been cooped up for too long and they're looking to get out and to consume. But um, it's, it's more than even I imagined. So some of our malls are seeing uh, this week compared to last, this week last year, uh, double the sales of um, what, uh, what we saw otherwise. So that's a little bit surprising in the uh, magnitude of the recovery. So I think that if this continues, and even if this is a bit of a bounce, I think luxury retail, at least in mainland China, will continue to do very well. Um, now, if I try to extend that a little bit to the US where we don't actually operate any malls, uh, but through our conversations with the CEOs of these luxury groups, um, I mean, everyone is very bullish on the US market. Um, and I don't see why that should uh, be too different, uh, at least this, uh, based on what we see so far. Um, one thing that we've learned from SARS, um, and Vincent talked about this a little bit earlier, is that things do come back. Um, and you'd be surprised how quickly they come back. Uh, you know, the human race is resilient. And I think that uh, if what we experienced back in 2003 is anything to go by, uh, retail will come back. As, um, uh, as others have also mentioned, we're social beings. So there's a natural need and a desire to be together, to rub shoulders and elbows with others. Um, and I don't think that that is going to change just because of uh, this pandemic. Human nature uh, has not been changed by COVID-19. So um, in, in mainland China, I'll talk a little bit more specifically, we had this big shift over the, uh, towards the end of last year of um, people not shopping uh, as much internationally and people shopping more locally in China uh, for luxury. And that has continued. Obviously now with travel restrictions in place, people don't have the choice to go overseas or to travel. Um, and so all the consumption is being focused into their local high-end malls. At the same time, we had these gray market uh, sort of individual importers uh, shipping things in from Korea or Hong Kong uh, or Taiwan or Japan in back into mainland China. Uh, you know, these guys aren't allowed out of their houses. They, they can't send things into China. Uh, logistics have been um, stopped. So that is absolutely uh, helping our business as well. 
So, um, you know, if, if I change tack just a, a touch on when it comes to luxury, you know, people ask, uh, has it fundamentally changed? I think no, but at the same time with COVID, people are definitely thinking more about what the purpose of retail is, what the purpose of luxury is. And so I think that the brands will have to change. This is really their purview, not, not mine, but I think they need to more clearly define their purpose and justify their existence. Um, to, to, to make a little segue into the world of online, um, it's actually very, very good timing because uh, everyone knows LV, Louis Vuitton, the, the luxury brand. They've just done a collaboration with League of Legends, which is an online gaming as a social game. Uh, they have both in-game skins where you buy basically clothes for your character, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, I think they're about $10 a piece. But they've also put out an offline collection, which is, um, I checked, it's actually on sale right now on, uh, on the LV website. So this is something, um, and actually a small side anecdote, I, I, I like to think I can take some credit because when we saw Bernard Arnault back in June, um, this is something that I specifically mentioned to him that they should really look into gaming. Um, and uh, they announced this in September uh, and it went live in October. So, you know, I like to think that maybe I had a hand in that. So I, I think that that is something that you cannot ignore. Um, people being stuck at home, I think video games have taken off. Even friends of mine who were never video game players uh, are now, they, they went out and bought a Switch. You know, that's the one thing that they had to go out and buy along with their groceries um, in order to play this Nintendo game, Animal Crossing. So I'm sure uh, those of you with children or even Actually, I'm sorry, probably some of us here play Animal Crossing. Um, Valentino, uh, one of uh, the other big luxury brands, uh, put on their spring summer 2020 lookbook on, Valent uh, on Animal Crossing uh, while everyone was sheltering in place and while the fashion shows were canceled. So I think that there's definitely uh, a certain shift uh, in luxury brands' mindsets to make sure that they're using all the online channels available. So. I mean, if I can draw a small conclusion, I think the forecast for luxury looks good. Um, I, I think that COVID was a big bump in the road and it's definitely taken out a couple of months uh, from 2020, but uh, if things continue on the trajectory that we're seeing, I think that it will actually continue to be a very strong year. Um, luxury is uh, going to outperform the market as it has been, and it's finding its way into online channels, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, in the ways uh, that we all that we all thought. Uh, so I'll talk a, very quickly about e-commerce. It's something that we've debated in, intensely over the past few years, um, actually kind of the past eight, nine years. Um, and you know, in, in the short to medium term, I actually, again, I don't see a fundamental shift. In mainland China, where online sales is already over 25% of household spend, um, you know, we're pretty much saturated. Of course, when you can't go out and when you can't go to malls, you have no choice but to shop online. So that's obviously going to jump up for the months that everyone was in lockdown. Um, in the US, uh, and these figures, I'm not sure if they're, they're recent because I think these are from last year, a household spend online is, uh, is not even 15%. So if you, if you say that China is saturated, um, then I think the US probably has another 10% of household uh, spend uh, to go online. And so I think that the pain for re US retailers is gonna continue. Um, obviously, uh, like I said just now, I think this is gonna be primarily uh, in mass in general and otherwise uninteresting, what I call uninteresting retail um, and unexperiential retail. But I think that there is still a lot of space for sales to go online. Um, so to draw that in with luxury, uh, the luxury brand CEOs that we talked to um, just a year ago, they were saying that online sales maybe were accounting for five to 7% and they saw it going up to maybe uh, 15%. Uh, when we most recently spoke to uh, uh, one of the big CEOs, one of the big group CEOs, he said that they now see online retail sales of luxury going up to 20 to 25% of their revenue. So that's quite significant. Um, so at the same time, you know, that sounds scary for those of us in the offline world, but at least in China, what we see is that is primarily incremental. What I mean is, so everything that's being bought offline is still growing, but there's an additional sales coming in for the luxury brands online. Um, and uh, in, insofar as that is you know, there's portions of that that are being taken away from offline. Um, I think that is primarily resellers and department stores, not their flagship stores. So if you're the landlord for a flagship luxury brand, I think that you're still probably very safe. Um, 
So luxury retail has always been experiential, um, and I don't think that that's, that sh has changed or will change, uh, but the brands had been very inconsistent previously. Uh, some had done it better than others. You know, they only put out pop-up stores or limited edition products from time to time. And I think that's going to become a lot more regular uh, as people really uh, become familiar with this online marketing and sales model. So, I mean, if I put these two together, I can't say that COVID-19 is fundamentally changing things uh, for retail and, and for real estate. I think it is accelerating changes that we've already seen happening. Um, and uh, so I think it will continue to accelerate those changes, but it's not going to make life completely different for us uh, in retail real estate. Yeah, I think um, obviously you play in a very particular place in the market, which is the high end. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably a much rosier picture than what we're seeing here in the United States where, you know, consumer spending contributes almost 70% of the U.S. economy and uh, retail sales have dropped, it says 16.4% 16, 16 in April. Um, so we're very concerned about retail sales here and, and obviously not just the high end, but the middle and, and even low level income as well. Um, I anticipate that probably there'll be a shift towards more flexible omni-channel retail models and fulfillment in the, in the you know, going forward in the future. Um, just some housekeeping, um, I was given permission to go about 15 minutes longer. So let's go through some uh, kind of power questions here for the audience. And then I will preserve about 10 or so minutes at the end for some of the Q&A that's coming through. Um, I did want to talk briefly about the hospitality sector and maybe I can lean on you, Goodwin, for this, but you know, um, as of this May, nearly seven out of 10 hotel rooms were empty across the United States, according to STR. And that doesn't even count the thousands of hotels that are actually shuttered right now. Of course, you have assets across the globe in hospitality, and you have um, 36 plus uh, hotels across the globe. Which one of those models and flags are likely to survive and which ones are gonna have a lot of difficulties? I think you said something like, you know, if you have a really destination oriented hotel, that that will fare much better. Right. Yeah, hospitality obviously is going to be the sector that's actually most impacted, right? Because uh, people's habit may very well change and some of the habits may very well be permanent in terms of the change. But I do believe there will also be winners. Uh, there'll be plenty of winners and losers out of this shakeout. Uh, probably less related to the brand side, but more related to asset side, right? Again, not too dissimilar to luxury from that point of view. The younger generation are all looking for experience. Anything that's, and going forward, likely anything that's more experiential, more sustainable, more eco-tourism driven, a lot of those will actually thrive. I think in the very near future, you're gonna have the drive to destination that will actually come back the first. We're already seeing it. Um, in fact, the uh, Expedia of China, trip.com, I think Jane was mentioning to us the other day that her, uh, since reopening a couple of weeks ago, her, car rental business is back to almost 90% of pre-lockdown. Uh, so people are renting cars, driving to within two hours, to drive back to destination because they've been cooped up at home for too long. Uh, a resort we have in uh, Bora Bora, for example, Four Seasons Bora Bora will likely do well. We actually have a lot of the people who have booked, who are canceling because we are forced to shut down by the government to now, instead of asking for the money back, they're deferring their, their prepaid trip to end of the year because they still want to go there and they are quite happy to get credit provided they get some additional benefits for food and dining, for example. And so I think people will likely say, instead of going on three to four trips a year, they will go on one of these special trip a year, save up the money for that one special trip, right? So, but, and I think you see that for business travels also, instead of people doing just a day trip or one trip for one meeting, come back the next morning, will likely group a couple of meetings into one so I think if you are in a big city, we own the standard in New York, uh, those of us in LA, those hotels in particular, dependent, if you are more dependent on domestic travel, domestic business, and you're more experiential, you will likely come back first, right? The more commoditized big boxes will likely be the last to come back. A lot of the, the hotels relying on mice business, convention businesses, those will likely be the last to come back because they have a lot of boxes to fill. Union labor is very expensive. Um, and big conferences are likely going to be um, a, a thing of the past, at least for the next three or four years, potentially. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of shakeout. And then also some of the niche hospitality strategies where people are 
cater to the outdoor space will likely do well. Right? That's something people are going to be want to expose to more and more. But some of those trends are already taking place and uh, will likely continue to go towards that end. Yeah, we've got to obviously get the airline business up and running too with respect to travel. And then some analysts are suggesting that 15% uh, of the market will disappear in the corporate travel market, which will obviously have huge implications as well. Uh, let me just go over to another um, kind of hot topic in this whole space is businesses that have a co in front of it. So co-working and co-living. And maybe I'll direct this towards uh, Vincent and possibly Jamie. Uh, what do you think about business model? Is, is that survivable? Or are they gonna be able to implement uh, and adapt in a way that they'll, they'll flourish? I mean, look at a WeWork there. You know, they take down a certain number of rooms, uh, space, they rent out a certain number of space and they're playing the arbitrage. But I'm not sure if that's gonna work anymore when you have uh, a reduced, you know, obviously market share. Um, Jamie, why don't you go first? Sure. I think that is interesting. And what we've always said about that WeWork model is do landlords really want to have another landlord sharing their mm -hmm. space with them? It works very well in um, a growing rent and, and decreasing vacancy um, market. Um, I think, you know, WeWork had some questions raised about it, um, you know, anyways, over the last several months. However, I think that co-living could very well still work. As I said, I'm still believing very, very strongly in um, younger people's desire to live in dense urban areas. And really what co-living is, is it's like a matchmaking service or it's like um, dorm or educational facility living as we've mostly done. So, um, you know, realistically, I don't see what COVID changes about that. If you're in a situation where, you know, two strangers have been quarantining or self-isolating for two weeks time and they're both symptom-free and COVID-free, then to become roommates and to share the same living space, um, you essentially become part of a household. And I think what we've been seeing in recent days is this generalized expansion of people's quarantine circles because of this you know, insatiable desire for human contacts, whether it's expanding your family contacts, you know, maybe your parents have been isolating for an amount of time and you have too and been really careful with your groceries or any type of shopping you've done, then you can you know, meet with your parents again. Um, I have three siblings and my parents, we all live by. So, you know, in a co-quarantine world, we get together for dinner every Sunday night. And, you know, this is an expanded circle than maybe what average people are seeing. But we know that our contacts um, basically encompass every one of our family members and whoever, whomever they may have come into contact with. Um, so I believe that co-living is still very much viable. It's more about the density restrictions that we see in Los Angeles. Um, about being able to create those limits and create um, the legal boundaries that help support um, that those types of contracts for you know joint and several liability among people living in one space um, who are sharing whether or not you can put a lock on your bedroom door um, for people who don't know you know you can share a communal area whether it's a living room dining room and kitchen and then a unit may have three or four bedrooms connected off of that. And, and that's essentially the co-living. Your bedroom is your private space. Um, but whether or not it's determined that putting a lock on the door okay. really creates a whole separate living unit versus that apartment unit being the unit counted. Um, those are questions that have um, yet to be seen or fleshed out really, um, especially in our, our area, which is why we haven't delved into it. But we're certainly interested because of this sort of wave of um, pent up demand that we've really been seeing for um, smaller smaller units with higher end finishes in heavily amenitized buildings. And, you know, like we were talking about the social aspect of it, people use their actual apartment as a place to store their stuff and a place to sleep at night, but all the socialization is happening outside of that, whether it's work or in the common areas of the building. Yeah, it's um, really interesting, and obviously it speaks to the, the the housing shortage. You know, we have a tremendous housing shortage of supply here in the United States. So density and creating new types of innovation in housing is really important. And I think the co-living uh, concept was born out of that. You know, Vincent, rather than have you follow up on that question, let me jump to the first question that actually came in, and it's related to some of the comments you made earlier. Um, but the first question for the group was: Hong Kong appears caught between U.S. and China trade war as well as political struggle over democracy. 
So far, property prices seem resilient in residential, whilst commercial is waning. What is the outlook? Um, I think um, in Hong Kong, because there is a big shortage of land, uh, despite the fact that we only built about one quarter of our land area here, but with all the restrictions that have been built into the system, we just could not use the uh, country park sites, which is 40% of Hong Kong's land. So I think because of supply and demand, so the, the property market is still holding up very strongly. Uh, but I, I, I do see a problem with the Hong Kong situation uh, because of all these uh, demonstrations and which sometimes can become very violent and it's worrying people. So uh, even for, for, for myself, I'm sure Goodwin and, and Adrian will be the same. When we know that there will be demonstration in certain areas, we don't want to go. And, and I think that will affect Hong Kong's uh, sort of um, uh, image and, 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 and our efficiency. So I think longer term, Hong Kong will have to really, I think, find a, a, a suitable arrangement that we can just continue to move on. But actually, um, I, I, I would like to make a, a small comment on the uh, co-working area. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be a trend that a lot of people want to work from home. Although I agree with what Goodwin has said, I think the back office people are likely that they can work from home. But it will have to have a different arrangement from just working really from home. Uh, I've been examining whether it's feasible that, for example, in our clubhouses, we will set up certain areas where people can work there and have all the securities and privacy. Uh, I don't think companies would be very comfortable that your work, uh, your staff can bring all the company information home to work, especially in a place like Hong Kong, where the uh, apartments are so small. Basically, you, you don't have any privacy and security. So I think in the, in, the, in the clubhouses, we can have an area where people can co-work with the security. Yep, absolutely. Question two and three are somewhat similar. So let me ask question three. With the recent policy by Twitter, letting their employees work from home indefinitely, what impact does this have on the real estate sector in SoCal and around the Bay Area? Uh, do you see same trend being followed by other companies? Um, our office folks are not in the Bay Area or California, but maybe Goodwin, you can comment on that. Sorry, the second part again. It was um, uh, Twitter allowing their employees to work from home. Uh, and what do you see, how do you see that impacting the SoCal and Bay Area sector where we have heavy tech exposure? And do you see other companies following suit? I mean, actually, you're already seeing the trend uh, in Sel SoCal, which are entertainment company centric and Bay Area, which are tech company centric. If you look in downtown San Francisco, for example, you probably have 15, 20 Google offices alone, despite the headquarters being in Silicon Valley, not far away. Right? So they already have been actually going towards, a lot of these big tech companies are going towards a trend of, of quite a few satellite operation to allow engineers to actually, who are working from, from home or have flexible hours to actually go in and congregate in these spaces, right? And back to, maybe this ties back to a little bit of, at least my thesis of the co-working space. That co-working model will likely have to change, right? We always, as Lena, whereas we always thought it's an interesting mismatch because the co-working operator are giving you a long-term lease, long-term liability on the balance sheet, yet they're actually getting very short-term revenue that can actually disappear. Uh, in, in 30 days or less. But there are also different co-working models where they actually focus on purely providing the flexibility to the large companies to flex up or down their workforces. And you can see clearly these large companies are willing to pay a substantial premium rent, sometimes two to two and a half times of base rent that the co-working operator is paying the landlord. So for the, I think for the large office landlord who knows how to actually be an operator, there will be an opportunity potentially for you to build these uh, spaces into your portfolio so that you actually are giving the flexibility to the large corporate tenants looking for the flexibility, especially in a post-COVID world. That could be a bit of a hybrid between what Vincent mentioned and, uh, and, and what today's current structure is. Perfect. Here's another question uh, on NAV. Are you seeing any immediate or foreseeable decline in NAV net asset value or devaluation of your assets? 
Uh, how are you projecting this potential decline in asset values and cash flows due to lower rent, higher vacancies, and widening cap rates? Anybody well, want to tackle that one? From my point of view, if you believe the three central banks in the world that matters are all going through a QE. QE means increased money supply, cheaper money, one thing's normalized. And if you believe in that, and you obviously then you have a couple of whether that correlates of your belief or demand substantially reducing. If the demand is going to stay flat, but your cost of capital goes down in 12 months when things subside, why would, why would cap rate goes up? Because your, your, your fundamental fiat currency is losing its value proposition. Yeah, anybody else want to add to that? Um, I, I think um, I agree with the Goodwin there as well, but, but I think with all the QEs that's going on, and particularly the Fed in the US is saying that it's unlimited. It's not going into uh, buying all the consumer goods, it's buying assets, and it's keeping asset prices up. And it's likely going to even go higher because you have so much money chasing so, so, so few goods. So if you have good assets, you need not worry. Agreed. Okay. Um, I'm trying to consolidate some of these questions. So, you know, unfortunately, we're not, we're running out of time. We're not going to get to all of this. Um, certainly, um, I could give my email address out, Zyman. It's tim.kawahara at anderson.ucla.edu. And if you have any questions that we're not able to get to, um, certainly send them on to me and I'd be happy to have uh, potentially the panelists, but certainly our experts at UCLA uh, offer some answers and some insight, including I could probably answer some of them myself. But we have uh, five minutes left. I just want to part with some, you know, kind of big picture questions. And this could be towards anybody, but I, it might be geographically um, specific, you know, but in terms of the recovery, and I guess this all de also depends on whether you might see a second wave of the virus, but you know, is the recovery going to be V, U, W, or L-shaped? Any thoughts? And again, that's probably market specific. Um, Rion, I think you unmiked yourself. I think that it will be as quick as we can open up. It's, it'll be the quicker we rebound. I think the longer that we stay closed and our society and, you know, the businesses stay closed, it's just going to hurt us and it'll be a longer way to recovery. And I think it just overall, the trajectory will just slow, will just more, be more slow. Yeah, anybody else? I want to say V, just because I want to be the perpetual optimist here. But I also think that it's, um, you know, what's going to be critical is, as, as Rion was mentioning before, some of the policies that have been coming down as far as rent payment, and um, you know moratoriums that have been imposed on landlords. The concept of landlords as evil is certainly not new, and we're seeing unprecedented suffering among people who are losing their income, losing their jobs, who are being you know handicapped by the virus, whether caring for family members or they themselves becoming very ill. So you know we try to be incredibly um, supportive and sympathetic and empathetic with all of that. But at the end of the day, you know the buck doesn't stop. With landlords and you know on the one hand for the government it is their responsibility i try to think of it maybe as um you know the same as imposing speed limits this is a public health crisis it is the government's responsibility to shutter businesses to keep people safe but it also is that to be supportive of the economy on the other end we've already seen you know unprecedented trillions of dollars coming out in business support um, that PPP timeline, the initial one, is ending very soon, however, and, and what I really think is um, this is probably going to take three or four times what has already been spent in order to buoy the economy to get on this trajectory that we wanted. At the, at the end of the day, the government understands that they are in control of um, you know, the stay-at-home orders, the reopening of business in a safe way, the mitigation of hospital utilization, which also means that economic cost of um, you know, promoting and supporting the individuals who are suffering through this and, and the business side of it too. So uh, I don't know exactly what the impacts of $11 trillion of government support looks like at the end of the day, but I know this is going to be the United States digging very, very deep 
to support um, the normalization of our economy as we come out of this, even if there is a second wave. Um, but hopefully, you know, a small amount of that money could even be put towards the mobilization and commercialization of vaccines, therapeutics, contact tracing, technology, any of these things that we have seen work very, very effectively in other countries too, to help support, you know, not just reopening because that's what Americans demand, but to be able to do so in a safe and responsible way. Yeah, good one. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I think, I think it, it depends on economy by economy, right? Uh, and also obviously how much of the U.S. media rhetoric is tied to the election cycle also in the U.S. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's always surprising that you don't hear actual stats comparing what would be a normal every year daily death rate, fatalities in U.S. versus what is happening now in terms of the Delta. And then how not enough focus is actually on why does Hong Kong have four fatalities and 1,060 plus cases? And why does Singapore has 27,000 cases with 21 fatalities, right? There's not, so it's, it's a people's psyche. If, if it gets to a point that, and these are not, these are relatively democrat, democratic economies, societies, and yet if they can keep the fatality that role, that would be uh, what Jamie mentioned as, as the post-management situation. If you feel things are properly managed, the fear factor will go away. Then it will be more of a V-shape. Otherwise, it will likely be a prolonged U-shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One last brief question. Um, any oh, correlation? Vincent, I think Vincent may want to say something. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm the big bear, unfortunately. I'm actually very bullish and cautious about the immediate two, three years. I think this is going to be a long, painful recovery process. And with a lot of bankruptcies and defaults, people losing jobs, I don't see the, the, the economy really bouncing back anytime soon. Especially, I think, with a lot of politics playing behind as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I just yeah, <laughs> am so bearish on this at this moment. Maybe Adriel can say something positive to end this. <laughs> I... Thank you, Vincent. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, looking at it uh, broadly, I think it, this is definitely looking more U-shaped, um, and it may even be a gentle uh, U, but I think it definitely will differ from sector to sector and economy to economy. So out here um, in mainland China, we do see the recovery relatively quickly and relatively strong. Um, the question is, what's the macroeconomic environment and the political environment going to have? What kind of effect is that going to have on us here in mainland China? Yeah, thank you. So unfortunately, we are at our allotted time. Um, it just does not do justice to have this level of panelists and not be able to take a deeper dive into the conversation. But um, hopefully the Asia Society will put on future programming. Um, and, but I did want to thank all of you. It's been a delight for the insightful conversation. Um, everybody, please be safe and well. And I'd like to turn it over to um, Richard Drobnik with the Asia Society, who I believe is going to close us out. Richard. Tim, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm the chairman of the Asia Society of Southern California and, and director of the 12-month mid-career MBA program at the USC Marshall School of Business. Uh, let me first say thank you, thank you to the panelists in, in alphabetical order, Adriel Goodwin, uh, my alphabet's working, Jamie, uh, Vincent, and Rian, and, and thank you to Tim for, for moderating the session. Uh, I've made four pages of notes, and, and I'm not a fast writer, so I, I got a lot of new ideas here. I, I really appreciate the time and energy. Secondly, I want to thank our, our participants. Uh, 1,038 people were registered by 5.15 p.m. from across the United States and a huge amount from around the Pacific Rim. So uh, I, I think that your, your, your participation here of our panelists, uh, the leaders of real estate investors, but real estate developers, has attracted an incredible audience and, and you're helping to lead a, a long-term conversation. And let me close by saying that uh, this is our Asia Society of Southern California, this is our beginning of the launch of a new real estate program, a real estate initiative. And we're exploring the idea of developing partnerships with the two leading uh, think tanks in Southern California about real estate. Uh, the Zyman Center for Real Estate at UCLA and the Lust Center for Real Estate at, at USC. And we also wanna explore partnerships with Asia Society centers 
in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Seoul, Tokyo, and also the great research institutions at the universities there. And so those conversations will continue with Tim and with uh, the, the Lust Center at USC and the other Asia Society centers. And at this point, let me turn this over to Asia Society's executive director, Charlie Coker, to make a couple uh, final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dick, and thank you, Tim, and thank you to all the speakers for a wonderful program. Um, we're very grateful for the eloquent and um, uh, discussion that has happened this evening or this afternoon and this morning for those of you in Hong Kong and in Asia. Um, we'd like to um, thank also the uh, numerous partners who've come together with us to make this, part, to make this uh, program happen. Of course, uh, thanks to Tim and the UCLA Zion Center for Real Estate and also our partners at USC Lusk Center for Real Estate. But we also like to uh, thank Asia Society, Hong Kong Center, uh, American Chamber of Commerce Shanghai, the Asian Business Association, the Hong Kong Association of Southern California, the Japan America Society, um, the Real Estate Alumni Group at UCLA, uh, as well as um, the USC Marshall School of Business IBEAR program and the USC School of Architecture. Um, we also would like to um, make uh, an appeal for um, for folks to donate if uh, if you're if you are um, if you were enjoyed this program and found it informative, um, you know please help us support us to um, to create more programs like this. Um, you can donate to uh, we've made these programs free to everybody to our members and to the public in general. Um, so any donations would be greatly appreciated at this time. Um, there will be a slide on afterwards, but it's basically asiasociety.org forward slash donate LA. Um, and also, as a final point, we'd like to um, have, uh, we have a program with the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall on Hong, about Hong Kong uh, and about Hong Kong on the brink, which will be on Wednesday, the 20th of May at uh, 4 o'clock Los Angeles, the 7 a.m. Hong Kong time. Hopefully you will tune, on, tune in for that program as well. And uh, again, thank you to Tim and to all the participants and all the speakers for their time and their wonderful insight. And we hope you will come back and uh, join us for our next program. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Dick. Thank you all so much. Thanks to everybody who came on. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.